Welcome to the ACL Lecture Series. My name is Alex, and I'm from the C Center. I'm from the Center for Labour Cities. Okay, the Center was jointly established by the Ministry of National Development and the Ministry of Environment and Water Resources in 2008. Our mission is to distill, create, and share knowledge on livable and sustainable cities. The CLC Lecture Series is one of the platforms to reach urban top leaders, share best practices, and exchange ideas and experiences. In today's session, we are honored to have with us Professor John Logan, currently the Department of Sociology at Brown University, and Mr. Lu Ho, President of America China City Alliance. They will both share about the social consequences of economic and political reforms in China, highlighting its housing market. The format for today's lecture will start off with a presentation by Prof Professor Logan, followed by Mr. Lu Ho sharing his insights and responding to the presentation. We will then have a closed panel dialogue among Professor Logan, Mr. Lu Ho, and our moderator for the session, Professor Chua Bing Huan, who is a Provost Chair, Professor of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at National University of Singapore. The session will end with a moderated Q&A session with the audience. Without further ado, let us start the session by inviting Professor Logan on stage. there's maybe 20 people or sometimes less and uh, you just never know who's going to show up so thank you for coming and I'm going to be talking about uh, Chinese cities uh, I first went to China in 1986 and uh, and it was a very different China at that time had the opportunity uh, never exactly to become a real China scholar but to keep going back and meeting people and doing little projects and and uh, picking up knowledge here and there. So, so over the last 30 years, I guess I've begun to have some ideas about what are the issues uh, that are important uh, for the future of Chinese cities. That's what I'll talk about today. Uh, I'm much more, I would say, uh, knowledgeable about American cities. Uh, and I want to emphasize that I know nothing at all about Singapore. <laughs> However, I do have a point of view about urban issues, and that is that uh, a lot of the same issues, pretty much the same basic issues, show up most everywhere. Uh, similar issues, although they show up in different ways, and, and they, they have, uh, we have different approaches to them and so on, but, but fundamentally I think they are very much the same issues. So as I talk about China, uh, and I'm going to say something about Latin America as a comparison. I'm, I'll start by saying something about the United States, too, as a comparison. But I invite you to think about whether the things I'm talking about apply here. And I'm going to uh, uh, depend on Mr. Liu, who follows me, uh, to talk uh, more. He knows China better than I do. Uh, and then the moderator uh, really knows Singapore, and, and I think his official job is to say, okay, we've heard these things, but how is it relevant here? Right? So this is, this is my hope, is that the issues I bring up will turn out to be relevant for you. Uh, an interesting thing about urbanization in China is how fast it's happening. Uh, everybody is impressed by the speed of uh, urbanization in China, although, in fact, China began from a very low level of urbanization. When I went to China for the first time, uh, I thought the cities were very big. But in fact, most of the population lived in the countryside. And I have a, a slide here that compares the percent of the national population that lives in cities a little hard to define what do we mean lives in cities but the urban population and comparing the United States over a very long time frame with China over a much shorter time frame and I've, I've actually I've used this chart a couple of times and uh, each time I see something a little bit different in this very simple trend data the striking thing is, oh, China has become so urban so fast. 
1950, like 10 or 12 percent urban. And today, everybody says, oh, it's more than 50 percent urban. Isn't that something? Uh, although the United States is 80 percent urban, so China is much less urban than the U.S. And in fact, I guess Singapore must be 100 percent. 100 percent urban. Because you don't have a hinterland the way uh, most uh, nations do. So there is this uh, very rapid urban development, and we're used to talking about how the, the very rapid pace of urbanization in itself makes it harder to deal with the problems. People are always adjusting to the changes. Uh, and, uh, and I think that that's part of the story. But I want to emphasize another piece of the story, and that is if, in fact, I would show it more easily if I redid the chart now to, to help you to see it. But if you look at the uh, trajectory of the United States and look on, the, on the, the blue dots for at what point in time was the United States as urban as China was in 1950. And so it's, yeah, something like 1850. All right, and then how long did it take in the United States to get to the point where China is today, to jump up to around 50%? So it's from 1850 to 1920, 1930, something like that, a period of 70 years. Actually, the United States urbanized in a period of 60, 70 years, as much as China has been doing now in the last 60 or 70 years. The pace of urbanization in the US was also very fast, and there were many adjustments to make. And that invites, I think, more interesting comparisons between these two cases. Uh, I'd like to mention a couple of other things that I notice now, looking at the American uh, trajectory, and, and what issues were showing up in the United States at this time, when, when the US was like China today, just in terms of urbanization. And what were the issues? Well, I, I think some things are quite comparable. First of all, uh, there was a tremendous uh, uh, high rate of immigration in the United States. And China does not have immigration, but it's had a very high rate of migration from rural to urban areas. And the United States also, by 1920, 1930, was experiencing a very rapid migration of African Americans from the South into northern cities. And there were very difficult issues of adaptation to that. These new groups, the African Americans, were extremely segregated. And they were relegated to a very, very low level in the occupational ladder. It was considered to be inappropriate for an African American to have a good job. No, they should be serving you, right? And that was the idea. So very, very strong prejudices. And even for the European immigrants, uh, of whom there were many, many more in the US at that time, it was European immigrants that urbanized America in that period, 1900 to 1920. European immigrants were looked at with a great deal of suspicion. And in fact, Woodrow Wilson, who was the president of Princeton University, you can say, oh, a scholar, uh, educated man, and then he became president of the United States, made comments about how we have this big problem of European immigration, that the people coming from Eastern Europe and Italy, they're not like the immigrants we used to get. No, there's so much more self-centered individual, they're just trying to make a buck and taking it from us. You know, we have to do something about this. And in the period around 1920 is when in American politics, we took official steps to cut off immigration from Europe. So, so, so this issue about the, first of all, the importance of outsiders to the functioning of the American economy and to the to the growth and expansion of cities and so on. Was like, we really depended on them, but we really didn't like them. 
uh, and it took quite a long time for them to be, become fully incorporated into the society. That's an issue of urbanization that shows up in China and probably it shows up here also. Uh, another issue that was very important in the US at this time uh, was the status of the working class and its position in, in American society. This was just before 1920, 1930. It was just before labor unions became really <coughs> legitimate. There had been some labor organizing before this time, but large-scale labor organizing, and, uh, the, the big companies didn't want to make contracts with workers and unions. Workers were pretty much underrepresented and paid very poorly and working under very poor working conditions. And in spite of the industrialization of the country, our working class in 1920 was uh, not very well taken care of and certainly not represented at the bargaining table. And I would say not very much represented in politics either. Uh, so this is a big issue. We've got <coughs> Not only they are not only immigrants, but they are a working class population at the bottom of the society, and we have not figured out how to incorporate them. This is America, just a little over 100 years ago, less than 100 years ago. And I think this is an issue for China today, for Chinese cities. The question of incorporation of new groups, and not only accepting them culturally and saying, oh, they're OK people, they're not responsible for all the crime and all the problems, but actually they're good people, we rely on them, but also their uh, incorporation as citizens and the acknowledgement of their rights as workers to represent their interests collectively. This is a very, very big challenge for China, as it was a very big challenge in the United States. In American politics, I have to tell you, you probably don't know the history so much, but Americans were hysterical about the communist labor organizers, you know, like this, just hysterical. So, and then finally, one other thing I wanted to say about this chart uh, is uh, notice what happened to urbanization right here between 1930 and 1940, where it stopped. And what's important here is not just that urbanization stopped, but the reason it stopped is because we had a big depression. And, and this is another issue that I think has to be faced by China as we look into the future. China has jumped up, whoa, 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 and you think it's just gonna go, you know, it's, it's a wonder, you know, it's, it's the miracle society. But the United States was not a miracle society. Why should China be the miracle society? This issue of whether, whether the, the rise is sustainable over the long term, or even if it continues over the long term, is it going to experience dips? Are there bubbles? No. And uh, all of the uh, urban social scientists that I know who are working in China are very sensitive to the possibility that uh, it will turn out that the uh, the mortgages, the municipal debt, the prices that are currently being paid, the speculative bubble, that it just can't be managed. And there's not enough foreign investors and there's not enough suckers in the domestic economy to just keep buying it. This is a big issue to consider for China. And so, again, I'm just making the, a comparison. Well, we have our historical experience in the US which even from 100 years ago makes us aware of these things that can happen. And I think that they, they <coughs> pose challenges also for China. Now, it's interesting. I, I had intended when I prepared the presentation, I was just going to spend about one minute with this slide. I was going to say, oh, you know, yeah, urbanization in China, isn't it going, you know, gangbusters? Isn't it something? But, but you see, actually, there's a lot more in this simple trajectory and things to think about based on the comparison. Uh, so I, I spent some time, and I'm going to go a little more quickly on some other things. But let's see where we are. So this is the, this is the image 
of, of the success of the Chinese economy. This is uh, back in 2002. The Economist, which is an international kind of commentary magazine, uh, had presented this image of what's happening in China. And this is the, this is the like the bubble will never burst kind of image. And everybody's in the car together having a good time. It's also like all, all boats are rising. And to some extent it's true. I think the overall quality of life in China in some respects, certainly in terms of material consumption, is improving. People have more housing, people have money, people are buying stuff. In those respects, I think there is an overall rise, but uh, it's not everybody in the same car, for sure. So that's, a, so that's another kind of an issue. And again, I want to emphasize uh, where are the inequalities in China as the country becomes more urban? And, and the first thing that I want to really focus on, and you may be surprised, is, is outside of the urban area, the issue of urban-rural inequalities. Uh, life in the city has become a lot, uh, except for pollution, except for a bunch of things, but it materially has become a lot better. People are living at a higher standard of living. But in the countryside, it has not been improving nearly at the same rate. And uh, the purpose of this slide is to show how over time in most countries, it turns out, that as the country becomes more urban, the gap between the city and the countryside naturally declines. You, have, you may have to look at the graph a little bit to, to start to capture what is being shown here. But it's, it's first of all, the urban population share along this axis. Of, of, these are all countries. And there's China, 50% urban. And then on the other axis, it's how much inequality there is between this, the countryside and the city. And at the early stages of urbanization, it tends to be high. But the, the usual theory is that uh, the transition to an urban economy uh, draws workers out of agriculture. They start making more money in the city. That the rural sector eventually becomes more modern and, uh, and more productive. And so wages rise there. And there's a convergence over time. And if you look at the, you know, the trend is that, in fact, at the, the very urban, the most urban countries, there's not much of a, of a gap between city and countryside. But look how China stands out from the graph. Given its level of urbanization, China is unusually, has unusually high inequality between the city and the countryside. And, and uh, I'd say this suggests potentially there's an issue, there's a problem. Uh, inequality in itself, eh, why should we worry about it? But when it turns out that people in the countryside have different expectations than people in the city, people in the countryside have different ideas about what is the possible future for themselves and for their children, and how are they going to manage to get ahead? And in a country that half of the population is still in the countryside, it's going to be a long time before they all get to the city. That. Uh, that this is quite a challenge and uh, a potential source of dissatisfaction and unrest in the society. Inequality can become really problematic, not just from the point of view of, I wish people in the countryside could live better, but from the point of view that the stability of the nation may hinge on questions like this. So this is one aspect of uh, inequalities rural urban inequality, and uh, I wanted to point out some data that suggest how it's increasing. It's not getting smaller. In the, I have, uh, these are data from a, an economist who's a colleague of mine. The, the gap between urban and rural consumption. In 1995, in 1995, consumption in cities was 
1.75 times higher than consumption in the countryside on average. That's a big gap. But by 2003, it was 3.1. And we don't have, I, you know, I'm, I don't work with these kinds of data usually, but I, I, would, I would not be surprised if this gap is increasing rather than diminishing as the country urbanizes and becomes more, I don't know, does it become more modern, more wealthy, more what, right? But more unequal seems to be. I want to uh, point out some ways in which these inequalities show up in people's lives. And I decided to use information about education to reflect this because education is so uh, central uh, to the future of people's lives. Uh, probably all of you, you are the kind of people that you value the education of your children. Or if you don't have children yet, you know you're going to value the education of your children as much as you value like how nice a place you live or whether you take a fancy vacation. It's the kids that matter. So important. And in China, uh, there is a recognition that rural areas have much lower levels of educational infrastructure, much poorer educational performance, and there is national official policies to, okay, we're going to fix it. One of the things I've learned about China is that uh, the national government, when it decides, when it picks one issue or two issues and says, we're going to fix it, it happens. Education turns out not to be one of those. It's something they talk about, but they haven't quite made that uh, commitment. And you can see the results in terms of, the, of, of school enrollments. This is one measure. I'm, now I'm showing you a graph that is what percent of 16 to 18 year old adolescents are enrolled in school? So high school age, are they in high school? And I've, uh, I've put this yellow bar around the, the eastern region. This is the eastern coastal, mostly urban region of the country uh, to show what's the, what is the, dis the difference between rural and urban high school and all. And you'll notice uh, there's a little bit of a gender gap. Now, this is interesting in itself. You know, gender gap is an interesting topic. But, but uh, a very large gap between people in rural areas and people in urban areas. 50 or 55% in rural areas of, of, this is the rich part of China, coastal China, eastern China, compared to 85% or so in the cities. Quite a gap. So you can see how, how different are the trajectories of the, of the lives of young people in these two parts coastal China. And I want to emphasize how the urban-rural inequalities in education get reproduced as rural people move to the city. And now they become the gap between the local people and migrant people. So again, same kind of chart. And I've, uh, I've bracketed in yellow, I've bracketed the city of Shanghai. Okay, now we're in Shanghai, one of the most, I would say, advanced parts of China where it, um, they, they do a lot of things right. And um, this, again, I, it shows data separately for men and women, and it's interesting that women actually are more likely than men in this age bracket in Shanghai to be in school if they're local people. So that's kind of interesting. But the, the story here is the gap between the 16 to 18 year olds who do not have a local registration and the 16 to 18 year olds who do. It's the locals versus the migrants. And, and it's between almost universal for local kids and, and way less than average, way less than 50% for migrant kids. There's a lot of reasons for this, but uh, a principal reason is that they don't have the right to attend schools. Now, again, the, the, the national government has decreed 
you know, it's, it's hard to study all the regulations and so on. But there, I believe that there are now regulations that say that yes, migrant children must be served where they live. But, uh, but they're not. <laughs> so, so there's a, a policy thing. The, the national government says, yes, you have to do it. The local government says, oh, yeah, but it would be expensive. And, and people don't like it. So we can't do it. And it doesn't happen because it's not a number one priority issue for the national government. It's like number five or number 10 on the list. It's somewhere around where environmental protection lives, you know? yeah, but not, not nearly like the Olympics or, okay. So uh, I've used a lot of my time already and I promised the organizers to go a little short so that we would have some time for discussion. Uh, and, uh, and so at this point, I'm just going to mention, remember that I asked you to consider to what extent any of these same issues are showing up here. For example, are there any issues with respect to the migrant population? Is there any, are there any issues with respect to, the, to the, their capacity to, to organize and to have life chances and to build families and futures? That's the kind of question that I want to raise about China. Uh, I think I'm going to, forgive me for, oh, I love maps. I, I'm going to have to show you a map. I love maps. They show so much. This is Beijing. And uh, this, this is the central area, core urban area of Beijing. And, and when we Americans or somebody goes to China as tourists in Beijing, that's, that's what we see. And then there's a larger, really urban set of districts around the core, which are, are still very urban. Most, you, if you were there, you'd say this is an urban environment. And then there's the countryside around that. So this is, this is the area to look at, the inner core and then the urban, I don't know, kind of urban inner ring or something. And I wanted just to show how separately people are organized spatially in Beijing. So this first chart represents where the migrants versus the local population live. And uh, the, the, pinker, the pinker it gets, uh, the more migrants there are. And the yellower or the lighter it gets, uh, the more local people there are. And notice uh, how strong is the, is, is the boundary, like this, this inner area. And you see the, the boundary of those four urban districts. And, and, and they're all extremely low in terms of uh, non-local people. And then right beyond, suddenly, there's this other world outside the urban core, which is predominantly majority, well, in, in 2000, it's not, uh, it wasn't a majority, but now it is a majority in those outer districts, a majority of outside people. The this, this spatial social segregation between local people and uh, non-local people is extremely high, and that's one of the reasons why there can be such differences in the infrastructure and the services that are available to them and the opportunities for their children. In the inner core, there's all the things you would expect to build if you were building a new city. You, you put in you put in shopping, you put in transportation, you put in schools, you put in healthcare, you put in, you know, you build it in. And it has been built in in the urban core over the decades. And it's largely missing in the outer area. So the, the spatial segregation represents a real difference in the opportunity structure that people have available. Another, another dimension of, spatial, of the spatial segregation is uh, what kind of housing people have access to. And in this chart, I'm giving the, the proportion of people living in public rental housing, which is what you call, what do you call H? Housing Development Board, HDB, right? You call HDB housing. Okay, so like it's affordable, 
except in China it was rental housing. Uh, and uh, and where, where was it? Notice how strongly it is concentrated in the urban core, oh, in the areas where the local people lived. And how much less was developed outside of the urban core. Now, in the last few years, there's been a substantial change, a shift from public rental housing to what you might call public owner housing. People got big subsidies to buy the apartment that they were living in, and now they're owners. And, uh, and so China has created a kind of a home owning, maybe I could call it a middle class, but I think that would be stretching it, kind of a home owning class of people who have a stake in the system, they have equity, they're noticing that prices are rising and the value of their home is getting bigger and they're thinking, you know, maybe I'm gonna get in that automobile with the champagne guys, you know, myself too, right? So, so there's that going on. But the other side of it is the extent to which a whole other piece of the population was totally excluded from that system because they were excluded from the public rental housing they never got the rental subsidy that was available to local people in the housing that was allocated through this, you know, these state mechanisms. And because they weren't living there, they never got the right to buy it. And so they're truly outsiders, truly outsiders in the housing system. And I want to really emphasize the extent to which housing is the source of wealth wealth, equity, I don't know, savings for the future for people. Uh, in China in 1986, when I first went there, nobody owned anything. Nobody had any money and uh, you, know, you had to depend on the, the system to support you. But today, a substantial fraction of the population has been given a stake, a financial stake for the future. And as the housing market rises, they are rising. But another substantial piece of the population, and now it's 50% or 60% of the population, was officially excluded from that system because they were migrants. And not because they were not citizens. This is a thing that always surprises me about how it works out in China. They're all citizens. They're all Chinese. They're all you know, compatriots. In the United States, we say, ah, oh, illegal Mexican immigrants. You know, they shouldn't get anything anyway. There's that attitude, right? They're not citizens. It's not our problem. In China, these are citizens. But they do not have urban citizen rights. And there is, I think, a major issue about whether, you know, who, who has the right of, the rights of citizenship in the city? Is it because you were born there? Is it because you're rich? Is it because you have a legal document that gives you a formal citizenship and a passport? Is it because you're working there and contributing to the society? Is, you know, are there any rights that people should have just because they are people and they are there? Like fundamental human rights? This is another pretty general concept, but a lot of debate of those different ideas about who, who should be urban citizens. In China, the public policy has been very clear to exclude uh, half of the urban population from citizenship in this form. And I think that that's quite a real challenge for the future. And, and I want to repeat, this is not my critique of China, because I started by saying this is how we did it in America in 1900, 1910, 1920. That's what we were doing. At the, and it took a long time to get beyond that, and it was a struggle. So it's, it's not that I think the Chinese are somehow making such a big mistake or it's so unnatural, but rather that it's something that's going to have to be faced up to. So uh, I have some data about these things. You know, I'm a sociologist. I, I have data, I have charts. I have, but I'm going to skip all of that and get to the point about, no, it's a good picture, but this is how rural people live in the city. It's a good picture, but I've already told you the idea, so I'm gonna skip it. Uh, talk about what is to be done. 
Now, I was going to give some theory. No, let me go right to it. I think the fundamental issue uh, here is the extent to which people have a right to participate in uh, determining their own futures, the futures of their neighborhoods, and, and, the, and their own life trajectories. And a very uh, interesting comparison to China in this respect is Latin America, and I'm using the Brazilian example. Brazil, where, where there, there is a tradition and a history of authoritarian government, you know, military dictatorship. But on the other hand, there's this kind of, there's always been a kind of participation, uh, uh, collective mobilization, people demanding certain kinds of rights, and so there's a, there's a real tension in Latin America between, on the one hand, uh, the top-down decision-making and the impulse for participation from the bottom. And this has come up recently in Brazil, which is now a like, fully democratic system with respect to the Olympics. You've probably read about it. I hope for your sake, Singapore doesn't get the Olympics. Are they in the, are they in the running for it? Anyway, yeah, the Olympics can, but in the, in the, in the, in the Rio case, there is the, there is the point that in order to host the Olympics, they have to wipe out pieces of the city. And the pieces of the city that they are choosing to wipe out, of course, are the ones where people have uh, less tangible, legal, documented rights to be citizens of the city. And uh, this is a, a typical kind of a, of a case where people in the neighborhoods are saying, you know, they, they think progress is demolishing us, but they are resisting. Well, they are resisting, but I'm not sure about their capacity to resist. There is a Brazilian uh, architect, urban planner type <coughs> person named Raquel Rolnick who has been Appointed for several years, she served as has a special position with the United Nations to deal with housing. And she writes about how when you have the World Cup, you justify not having to enforce human rights, environmental legislation, basic rights, no, suspended like a war or catastrophe. And that most communities, in this case, are not informed of the development of projects before they are displaced. They have no chance to debate and present alternatives. And so this is the issue of participation. Uh, in the Chinese case, uh, I'll just very briefly share with you my own personal early experience. This was in 1991 in Shanghai. I was visiting, going around the city and looking around. And, and we stopped somewhere and saw this crowd of people. They were all crowded around the billboard. And I said, oh, this is really interesting. Some kind of collective event or what, you know? So what, what they were reading was the poster that told them the official date that they were going to get moved out. And of course, they were very interested in knowing what the date was going to be. But they were not in a position to do anything about it, right? It was somebody else's decision. and. And they were, they were reacting, reacting. So this continues to be generally the situation in China that to some extent people do react when, when decisions are made about the future of their neighborhood or the land that they thought that they occupied or the character of their housing development or the, their access to services. They are reacting more and more. Uh, but mostly informally and mostly without very much impact. Not very strong connections into the political system. So I would say that very much like Rio in the period of the Olympics, that Chinese cities suffer from a, a, a very limited participation of people. Uh, and it's, these were the local people. These aren't the migrants. The migrants would they're outside the city, they're not being redeveloped yet. These are the local people without certain kinds of rights of citizenship. And I think that in the long term, that's probably not sustainable. So uh, there are some things that I think ought, ought to be done. The policy conclusions is obvious with respect to rural urban inequality. There's things that the, the state should do, should become state policy. 
make it easier for people to move out of the countryside somewhere else and to have a better life where they do move. And more than that, to invest in the countryside in various ways and land reform, schooling, changing the way that capital markets operate to make it more, to improve the return on investments in the countryside. Uh, these things could be done. Uh, and within the city, there are obvious steps. Everybody would say that migrants need to be integrated into the civil society. In fact, I was, at a, I was at a conference at Stanford University last June, and the, the people who organized the conference were very well connected, much better connected than I am. And they had invited people who are on this kind of state economic planning council to come and talk about the future of urban China. And okay, I'm very interested in what are they saying, what are they saying? And they said, well, we know, we know that migrants have to be incorporated. We know the current situation just cannot possibly work very long into the future. But on the other hand, we figured out that in the next five years, there's nothing we can do. We, the obstacles to doing something are too great. Maybe in 10 years, there's a trajectory that we can follow that will make a difference. But in the short term, we know it's a problem, nothing we can do. But it's obvious what they would have to do. So I've listed a few steps, and I, I'm not going to take the time to explain the meaning of them all, but uh, as you read the slide, you'll, you'll get an idea of some things. But the important thing for me is this, at the end I mentioned, and what are the obstacles, what are the obstacles to dealing with the urban-rural inequality or to deal with the gap between local and non-local people within the city. What are the obstacles? And there are normal, natural, social, human things. Like if you provide better housing and if you provide better education and you provide health services and you provide oh, the basic safety net, who's going to pay for that? Who is going to pay and who will benefit? And it turns out that, that who benefits looks like different than who pays. And so that's a good reason not to do it. And there is the issue of political backlash. I've always felt that the way that market reform was carried out, carried out in China was done, despite the fact that it's not a democratic society or a participatory society, it was always carried out in such a way as to provide benefits to certain segments of the population that were perceived to be the important sectors, the ones whose support you need to have in order to maintain st st a stable regime. And I think that the, the urban local people in major cities were selected as one of those constituencies, key constituency, and that it was decided, and I think it is still the view, that the rural migrants are, they're not a, they're not a threat yet. Even though they're 50, 60% of the population, they're not organized, they can't be mobilized, we don't need them, we can put them off. And so the question, what are the obstacles to the obvious policies? I think the principal ob obstacle is, it's a political obstacle that the, potential backlash from those groups who are currently advantaged by the system against sharing more fully the benefits of citizenship with others. I think it's perceived to be too great a cost. And this is why these guys at the Stanford conference were saying, we can't do anything for the next five years, but maybe in the longer term we can figure out how to do it. So that's the, this is where I'm left, actually. Uh, somebody at the beginning introduced himself to me and said, ah, last week there were some political scientists talking all about politics, but as a sociologist, maybe you'll have a different slant. And, and I did introduce some things that are not just about political science, but in the end, I'm bringing you to, to the question of politics. Politics and policy and power and who has it and with what consequences. And uh, oh, I, I generally ask here, this is my usual question, whose interests are served by a set of decisions and projects and visions of the future? 
And who is in a position even to ask that question? And I think a particular problem for urban China is that so few are in the position to question. Professor Logan. Now we'd like to invite our respondent, Mr. Lu Ho, on stage for his presentation. Thank you so much. I appreciate everybody showing up this afternoon, and uh, obviously, people have an interest in what's going on in China. And uh, I uh, Spent about uh, 20 years in the uh, U.S. Uh, working as a city planner and urban designer for, since the 80s. And I came back to China about 10 years ago, uh, st still working as a uh, planner and a consultant. <coughs> uh, but I'm not a sociologist. I, 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 I cannot claim I, I know a lot of the social science. Uh, but as a city planner, as, you know, as, uh, uh, by education, by training, we are uh, trained to, to, to keep an eye on social issues when we do uh, physical planning direct, uh, projects. So, uh, uh, here we go, uh, we, uh, here I am, and um, to, I think uh, the Professor uh, Logan has provided uh, a very good uh, you know, uh, information on what's going on in China, and those are uh, 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 deep issues, deep insights of what's happening in China. And, uh, 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 I, since I have, uh, I was born in China, I spent my uh, uh, first 30 years in China, <coughs> uh, living in China, and uh, then I, after 45, I, I, uh, almost 50, I, I went back to China, and so the last few years, so I, I, I kind of witnessed the, 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 the Chinese uh, uh, urbanization process in the last 30 years, uh, since the economic reform started. Uh, so I'm going to uh, take us, uh, everybody uh, a closer look at what's, what's going on in, in China. Uh, uh, it may not be you know, uh, scientific, but it's, it's my observation. <coughs> so uh, so in, in, uh, mine is a little bit more graphic, so it's not, uh, it's, it's, uh, 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 it's not as scientific as uh, uh, Professor Logan is, but let's see what, what I will talk a little bit about the, the great migration that uh, uh, taking place in China, both uh, regionally from the, uh, the countryside to the city, from the east to the west, but also within the cities. And I'm also concerned about uh, the working classes, and uh, I'm going to talk about that. And uh, then the farmers, the Nongling Gong, the, the people uh, living in the country and, and working in the city, seasonally, what, uh, what's their conditions. And uh, the urbanized uh, village, by that means the villages uh, been uh, uh, surrounded by the, the urban development. Uh, those villages, uh, how they treat the villages, and I think what's the, the, the you know uh, the opportunity to, to do some better uh, treatment. <coughs> and uh, the last uh, the issue will be the public housing, and uh, I mean different. Uh, Kind of the type of the public housing, and I offer a little bit of suggestions at the end, and quickly go through that. This is an image that uh, the Chinese uh, 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 internet companies uh, has developed over the uh, 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 spring festival, in, in the traditional uh, festival in, in China, where the millions of million people work in the city during the year and uh, go back to their uh, uh, home. And this is the, uh, their track of, of the people's uh, cell phone and to get this image. You can, you can bring up, a, during that time, you can, you can, you can you bring up any cities that, that uh, at a certain uh, uh, time that people actually travel from the different place. That's how, if you can imagine the, those lines of uh, individuals to, to, to travel through China, and how, how the, the migration has taken place. And this is the image that we can uh, almost imagine. <laughs> but this is extreme uh, cases. It's not that you, you see it everywhere, but uh, some of the major cities in the in 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 uh, uh, train station, uh, this is what you see. And this urbanization has taken place, uh, uh, mainly uh, taking people from the west to the east. You know, originally in the 80s, people moved from the 
uh, north slope south, where Guangzhou, Hong Kong, or Shenzhen, those areas. But now, generally, you know, people are moving from the west to the east, uh, and from the, the countryside to the cities, then maybe nearby. There. But the main trend is from the, east, the west to the east. And also migration with, uh, the <coughs> within the city boundaries, or, or near the city. And uh, there were this uh, uh, great forces, uh, people move into the city from, from the countryside or from other regions. This, this is an uh, example in Beijing. But at the same time, the people also within the city start to the, uh, move to the, to the, towards the uh, outskirts, where, uh, you know, from the center originally, and then, then go to the inner suburbs, and then go to the outer suburbs. Uh, I will show some of the data later that uh, Beijing has uh, uh, moved this in this direction. <clears throat> you know, people move uh, for, for certain reasons. They, 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 the kids get married, or they have, uh, want to get better housing, and uh, this is Beijing, uh, the central city on the left, this uh, the, 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 the population shift. So you see that the central city in the sun, sun In, uh, during the night, uh, 2000, the year 2000. But in the last years, people have further moving out to the outskirts. <coughs> and, uh, and this is uh, showing the, the, the construction uh, areas that that happened. That the, you know, the, the yellow line in the last couple of few years have moved up, more, more construction going on in the outskirts uh, uh, suburbs uh, than the uh, inner suburbs. So that's a lot of. Uh, uh, construction and the new uh, 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 housing projects going on uh, outside the city. And this is uh, what's the consequence is that the people have to, you know, take a transportation and, and uh, uh, of different models to uh, mode to, to get to the city or to, to get to the work. And this is uh, how, uh, where it builds that uh, massive housing uh, because the, <coughs> the, the uh, both outside and also inside the, uh, the inner city, uh, cities. And so this is some examples of this in Beijing. This is the one of the earlier ones, the Wangjing in Beijing. Uh, it takes about like a, a 20, uh, 200,000 people population in, in the area. And this is a uh, uh, Tong Yuan, about 350,000. Uh, uh, in Huilun uh, there's another uh, 35, uh, 350,000 uh, people in population. And there's a newer section with a lot of the public housing going on in the east side, the Changying. Uh, all this is the largest uh, scale of development, housing development uh, around the city throughout China. It's not just in Beijing, but also other places. But uh, when this you know, population is shifting going on, and there's the major things that have been uh, uh, stimulate the public discussion and, and to some angry voices is, is that the, the uh, demolition and the relocation of people. <coughs> the, 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 this is a, a particular, uh, sometimes it's getting very uh, uh, serious when you know, people uh, you know, they have, they have to get their house uh, uh, demolished you know, without a, to get a just right pay. But with so much, I'm not going to get into that, those details, but so I'm mean, trying to get question is, you know, do we really need some of the, the roads this wide when you see that the, 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 the traffic is not that bad? In the future, maybe it, it, it's going to be uh, more traffic, but at a uh, time, with really some of the roads are really not necessary to, 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 to be widened that, that fast, which will dislocate a lot of people. <coughs> and those uh, the uh, so-called uh, uh, slum areas, and uh, when there's massive demolitions going on, relocation, 
and you know, we have to ask who, who's, who's going to, the, the Professor Logan is asking who, who will uh, benefit and how much they get benefit. The, the mentality was they turn this down and all built a high rise, just like, like, like the high rise behind this uh, low, low rise uh, slum areas. And that's the kind of maximize of land value, which sounds pretty good, but when you, when you actually because I, I work in the U.S., I used to manage the, the uh, uh, development densities. We only give them certain, you know, uh, 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 certain uh, uh, space for, for, for their profit. We, we, we normally will not allow the, the, the maximum of, of the land value for, for one, one development. Because in the future, we will never be able to redevelop this area if they are not if things have changed. So, but in China, they, they always maximum the, 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 the land value, which is, you know, great for the developers, but you lose the opportunity to do, you know, other things. <clears throat> and also, you know, do we really need to develop so many housing, uh, uh, and so much, and, and so tall? Uh, in, and first, ask how much is this really related to the people you need? <coughs> and that are the, 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 the migrants. So uh, that's uh, the kind of uh, uh, things going on in the city, but also uh, housing for the working classes. Uh, this is uh, the, 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 the kind of images we, we actually get in, in, inside China that uh, what's the uh, general working classes are, are composed of. And this is the uh, uh, the image of, of No Ming Gong is, is uh, at the lower pictures. The, the, there's an older generation. Those people have been working in the city for the last 20 to 30 years, and they are ready to retire. They're, they're, there's no space for no, no place for them to stay in, in the city, and so they have to go back to the, the countryside. But the, the new generation who has the, uh, the, the you know the, 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 the physical strength to come to the city, and also they have a you know. Uh, idea of moving to to the city, and they never learned how to uh, you know do the farm. Those people th didn't want to, this second generation, the new generation. They don't want to live in the countryside. They don't want to do the agricultural work, and they uh, they all want to expect to move into the city, and the, the city is not accepting them. Uh, well, not in, in a complete sense anyway. But so, just, so I think those are, uh, are issues, and also. Uh, you know, from my observation, when the the urban the housing development in a city has the price has gone so high and it's almost irrelevant to the normal people. But the housing you know the development is still going on. More houses being built, and I think the house now been built for the rich people to you know as an investment tool. Uh, and then those uh, people they. Uh, they, they actually afford to, to, to buy the house, they don't really need it. And the people who really need it, it's not getting the house. So those people are really taking up a lot of the, 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 the land resources. And, uh, uh, and that costs the, the housing price going up. And as a result, some of the communities, you, you sell, uh, very seldom see any, anybody in the, uh, in the community. So, this is some of the examples near Beijing and in Mongolia. And the, 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 the middle class, we, uh, as, uh, when I was in China, before I left China, we already heard about the middle class. We didn't understand what the concept mean. But for the last 30 years, the econ economic uh, growth has taken place. And now I don't, you know, I don't hear anything talk, anybody talk about the middle class anymore. Is this idea still relevant? Do we need it? Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Professor Logan had raised that if, if the economic classes, whatever they are, can this stabilize the, the, the nation? If not, I think we still have to, the, the idea of, uh, of middle class is still relevant, I think. Of course, in China, the, there's just people try to define what's the middle classes. But I think the image on the, the, the football on the left side is, is what we understand about the middle class as, you know, as people uh, distribution, income distribution. But in China, it's where 
I think we're seeing more and more like the, the image on the, uh, the right side of the tadpole uh, 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 pole. And with a, a, a new, a larger group of people getting good incomes and becomes the uh, 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 upper uh, middle classes, where it's a, a long tail of, of a group of people and then, then they have a very low income or, or a very average uh, income. And this, this is gonna, gonna, gonna uh, be an issue that uh, uh, the Chinese government has to face in the next uh, 10 or 15 years. And also I see the urbanization bubbles in China. When they talk about the 50 or 55, 52% uh, of the population urbanized, uh, I have uh, got a lot of the, the, the data showing you the, like my friends or the, 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 my colleagues have got this is, you know, the actually uh, urbanized, urbanized population with uh, the household registration in the city is about 35%. Between 35 and uh, 52 or 55, that gap, I see those are, 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 are we call the floating uh, population, the people living in the countryside and working in the, in the city in a uh, seasonal uh, manner. And those are the major challenges for the, uh, the, the urbanization process to, 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 to resolve. Uh, and next is about the farmers. The, the farmers' condition, they, the, you know, the China has, has been a country that relied on agriculture for thousands of years, and uh, some people say for four thousand years. And uh, in the east part of China, the, the, uh, the farmers uh, are uh, the farmers' condition are uh, improving, so uh, they get to the uh, uh, they are they are more likely to, to be uh, called urbanized uh, in. Uh, in blended into the city. But in the rest of the country, most areas are uh, a process of uh, uh, kind of uh, being forced to, to be urbanized in, in some way. But uh, in, uh, the question I want to take is, is the, 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 they call it the new village movement, the, the government initiative. Uh, and they, they, they forced the, the, the villagers to build the, the multi-story uh, buildings and live, uh, live in there like, like a, uh, 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 urban city residence, where they don't have any uh, skills to, 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 to live in an urban area, but, uh, but also how, how they uh, get treated. So like, uh, they take the land, they give you a very little value of, of the land you, you, you give up, and, and, and they take it most of the part. <coughs> And also, they don't have a, you know, a, a skills to, to live in the uh, Midwest households, and cannot afford the, the urban living cost. <coughs> uh, but I see the, the, the 250 million farmers, uh, uh, seasonal working in the city, and they leave their families behind in the older the villages, and the, their living conditions been uh, uh, drastically declined. <coughs> And uh, if the city really uh, offered that, uh, you know, the, 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 the opportunity for them to, to, to stay in the city, I'm sure they would not leave their uh, family behind. Or if the, 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 the city does, cannot make that offer to, to, the, to the, the, the farmers, and they should not take advantage of, of them with low in, uh, income. So the, uh, those social issues would, would not be appeared. So I, I really think that they need to do some uh, studies on this uh, normal loans uh, situation. But I think it, that it's become too political to, to, to talk about. The, the, this is a, some I skip this. It's just more of an emotional thing. But in a village, urbanized village, they, they always treat the, the villages, uh, including in an urban area, as a, as a cancer. They said that those are, uh, this, this have a, a very bad uh, uh, sanitations uh, and desirable social orders and, and, uh, and uh, uh, very uh, too dense and uh, hazard, uh, uh, hazard potentials and the land use efficiency. So they take the, all the, the villages out, wipe this out and build high rises. This is one example in Beijing, it's very famous. Uh, it, uh, they made a movie out of this, uh, this place in uh, Tangyang. And, uh, and it's another one in, in Xi'an, uh, Dongbali, uh, where 
you know, they wipe out the, 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 the villages and build the high rises and to, to make the land use to, uh, to its maximum uh, value. <coughs> and uh, would this be really necessary? Or if they really think that the villages are in bad condition, why they, you know, inter, uh, inter, uh, uh, intervene with, uh, with uh, uh, some planning uh, and, and uh, uh, management measures so the, the, the villages will not become so bad. <clears throat> but anyway, this is another uh, concept about the, the uh, housing with a semi-public right, which I don't probably don't think uh, exists in Singapore or anywhere else in the world. Is the, 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 the Chinese land system have uh, two different categories. So once the, uh, the, the government owned the land, and, and another uh, uh, category is the collective owned land, which is uh, refer to the, the villages. The villages were uh, on the land they, they farmed on and they lived on. And this is a, 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 in the constitution, they, they, they were defined as a two categories. And, and the question, key question, you know, now is the hot, because a lot of people cannot afford the, the, the urban housings, uh, housing in, in, uh, on the private development, so the, the villagers, villagers sell the land or, or build the houses on the land and sell it uh, uh, with a low, lower price. And a lot of people get those, and uh, some people uh, estimate about 20% to, to 50% of all the uh, housing stock are, are, are uh, housing with semi-property rights. And the government have been, have been trouble now to deal with this, but uh, they, I think eventually it will be solved. But the quick, key question is, how do you define and manage the, the rights of the public with uh, collective lands as defined in the, in the Constitution? And the last is about the, uh, uh, public housing. And uh, in China, they have a the various type of public housing uh, as uh, listed there. And the government have declared that uh, in a few, uh, two years ago, they want to build like 36 million units of public housing, rental housing, in the next five years. And uh, they are implementing this. and. Uh, it's making progress, and some of the recent uh, the world reports uh, that uh, has shown some of the uh, rapid growth of uh, urban uh, uh, public uh, rental houses, as shown in the yellow part. <coughs> and the government are making effort uh, throughout China to, to, to develop this uh, 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 the, uh, designate all this uh, the cook. They, they, could, they give the, the, each of the provinces a quote and how much they have to develop for the, the public housing. And uh, <clears throat> the problem with the, the, the public housing is, is still, you know, the privileges, if you get to, 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 to get one, uh, the public housing. The whole goal is always the, 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 the way uh, to, to, the, uh, to block people out. You know, whole goal has, a, I, I see it as playing uh, two roles. The one role is, is, is to keep the, the uh, urbanization process in order, and so far it, it has not been going uh, uh, crazy. It's because the Hukou has played a good role, but uh, also the Hukou has keep a lot of people uh, uh, from accessing to the, the to the uh, public entrance. And also, so far, the the, the uh, local government and the developer are now showing their interest to to, to participate in uh, public housing. They they they. Well, I wouldn't go through into details, but the last things we can discuss it later. Was, and also, the, the, you know, with all the land publicly owned in China, right, why they cannot have, you know, public housing? And I, I think China has a, a great advantage by having this public land, which many other countries don't have. But they, they're not, you know, providing the, 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 the affordable housing so far. No, at least not enough. I think that there would be some issues involved. And so the, well, some of the, uh, the I believe this was a, the, some of the suggestions you can read. Uh, I think I've been over the time already. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Luho. Right now, we're going to have the uh, panel discussion. We're going to invite Professor Logan, Professor Chua, and uh, but before we invite the questions on the floor, there is a gentleman doing a Q&A. You can raise up your hands, you'll bring the microphones to you. However, please 
tell us a name and tell us where you come from before you post your question and your comments. Okay, so just wait for a while while they set up. Anyways, personally, I think today's um, sharing was actually really amazing. I like the first part where Professor Logan shared about the transition, how urbanization actually leads to some similarities between China and the United States, and how he actually brought in the idea of Brazil as an example. And the second one, I think what's very interesting for me is the fact that the idea of what has, what has migration done to China? What has happened from the farmland into the urban cities, and what are the issues that you need to face and think about? I think personally for me in this situation, I, it's a social issue, an economic issue, and yet, at the same time, it is a political issue. Okay, I think we're all set. Can we now invite Professor Logan, Professor Chua, to take your seat? Okay, Professor Chua, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, so you've heard basically, a, I think, generally quite significant agreements between the two speakers about the problems that are currently facing the rapid urbanization problems in China. Now, um, the let me just sort of make one reflection and then maybe sort of raise some statements about what what it is what does a Singaporean do with this set of information in terms of thinking about ourselves. And uh, one of the interesting problems in terms of academic analysis, and this applies to all of us, including myself, is that we tend to somehow, we have the privilege not to act. And I think that is a very interesting privilege. We have the privilege not to act. And because we have the privilege not to act, as we are analysts, so we then see a set of problems that require that that seem to be uh, seriously the result of actions of the government of the state. Whereas uh, and and whereas on the other side of the boundary is the government uh, or the state that has to act. And so, for example, in the case of Hukou, there's been a very constant complaint about why not remove the Hukou. And it seems, and there's, there, there never seemed to be any sort of rational reason why not. And, but somehow, uh, either there really isn't any reason not to remove it, or that there are good reasons that we don't know about. And the good reasons that we, that we don't know about and the Communist Party of China is somehow either reluctant or refused to or incapable of articulating it. Because it's a problem that is so glaring that how could the state not act? Okay, so that's to me a, a a kind of interesting dilemma of being analyst on the outside, looking at an issue and then pointing out the really obvious problems and yet the people who need to do something about it stubbornly refused. So that, that's a kind of interesting problem. Now when we think about what's going on in China right now, in reflection to what is what has been going on in Singapore. And it's ironic that we are comparing probably one of the smallest countries in Asia with the largest one. And yet, yet in, in an ironic way, 
there are a lot of reasons to compare China and Singapore because the political condition of the, of the two countries are relatively similar as a result of our, because as a result of our political history, we have developed a single party dominant state, which is similar to the communist state of, of China. It's also fairly interesting that we have, not by political fiat, but by different processes, come to a condition in which the state owns the majority of the land in the country, as in the case of China. So you have a, a similar condition of a, of a kind of nationalization of land, which actually makes redevelopment, which actually facilitates redevelopment, and which is the, why the question that you ask why is China in possession of the land still could not provide public housing? Which is one of the reasons why we could like provide public housing is because we have nationalized a very large chunk of the land that makes development possible, that reduces land speculation, uh, and that in fact puts a lot of pressure on, public de on private developers. So there's that. Then, uh, you know, so. I, and I think that the kind of resettlement patterns that is now creating so much trouble in China is, in a certain sense, if you look at the Singapore development history, particularly in the housing sector, between 1965 to probably about the late 70s or even, yeah, about, let's say, the late 70s or early 80s, there was a lot of the same kind of destruction, if you call them destruction. The difference is, of course, that there is an immediate replacement of housing. Uh, whereas in the Chinese case, the developers are not, uh, not always the state. So you have this conflict of where the private, the, in, in ironically, the, the kind of redevelopment pattern in, in China of tearing down, demolition, redevelopment, is a lot closer to the American experience of urban redevelopment of the 60s, where the, where the displays are just kept moving along with the bulldozers, rather than being properly reset of it. And so there, in that sense, there are some lessons to be learned. And finally, I'll stop here with to say that it's precisely because of certain kind of political con economic conditions that are that prevails between Singapore and China, that, that the Chinese government has in fact publicly said that in a, in, at least in a lot of urban management and governance, they should learn from Singapore. And this manifests itself concretely in the fact that the that Nanyang Technological University has run a Chinese mayor training program for the last 15 years. And every year, about 100 Chinese potential mayors would come to Singapore and do a one-year program, a one-year policy training management program, essentially to study the Singapore urban management system. The outcome, of course, is interesting is that from the feedback we get is that all these people, all these potential mayors that goes home, they get trained here and they go home, now they know what to do. But the environment doesn't allow them to carry out what they have learned. So there's developed a certain kind of frustration among the trained about their disposition once they're in position of being able to do something. So I think there's a lot to kind of think about in terms of comparing, uh, although you might not be familiar with what's happening in China, but I think that uh, with your experiences of working of, of Singapore, know, the knowledge of Singapore, there's a lot to talk about uh, and raise questions about both of China reflecting on its experiences and 
hopefully learning something about ourselves. For that, uh, I'll open the floor to the first question. Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. And um, um, very interesting right now, uh, you have heard that China right now has some uh, unrest and at the Huaming area. So because of the minority, actually, and um, actually in Chinese cities we can say the minority are mostly invisible for um, for research and also for the public sphere because it's depressed usually. So there is a lot of mi um, minority migrants who are even in the lower hierarchy than the normal migrants like urban, urban villages because they have even less access to the public services and um, and, and also for their religious uh, respect, for their religious um, freedom. So, and actually in Singapore, the ethnic, it's a place that um, also a lot of um, ethnic um, groups has lived together and also I don't know um, yeah they have Singapore is always um, in its propaganda as it's very good at its the, the urban governance that to deal with all those things and make them living in harmony so I'm just to raise this issue I'm just interested what um, could China right now doing because the minority they have and um, um, not them they are not minority actually it's not politically not so correct so how those um, the ethnic groups and uh, the larger Chinese groups could how to solve those kind of urban problems and uh, because right now the in the political language is just um, going to make uh, I don't know how to express more academically just uh, um, so maybe if you can, any of you could explain something, what's your opinion about these issues? Because those issues are always there just because there's other okay, issues. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. I think it's, it's interesting. There's uh, it's, uh, lots of uh, interest uh, probably outside China, but inside China, uh, honestly, I, most of Chinese uh, see this minority issues uh, in a uh, somehow different way than, than the outsiders. Uh, in China, the, the, the government uh, did enact some uh, policies to uh, to give a, uh, some uh, special privileges to to the minority groups, like you can you can have two children or, or, or more, where the general population uh, of non minority <laughs> would not have, to have, or they when they go to school they can have a, a, a with a lower lower uh, scores. Uh, uh, so those things uh, uh, minority, but but when I think we uh, perceive. As a problem only when there's uh, some political uh, reasons. Uh, for uh, you know, it all depends. In, in, in Singapore, uh, I, uh, when I talk to some people, they say, you know, if we compare to the West, where you know, emphasize on the freedom of speech, then you will never satisfy with a Singapore kind of condition. Uh, same as in China. But uh, if you consider about uh, the, the life quality that governments are provide to you. You probably say, "Okay, well, I take that." <laughs> As I said, so in China, the people they that's the way they, they look at the things. They didn't feel most of the minority as issues, uh, so they can they can live with that. Uh, and the most minorities uh, uh, does think uh, it's okay. Uh, but I am not a minority, so I, I really don't know really what's on their mind. But uh, that's just what uh, you know, most people as a non-minority perceived. In, in, in China, maybe I'm wrong, but I, that's what I, I've seen this in my observation. I'll, I'll just add a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, in, it's, it's interesting that within China, uh, this term minority refers to a very small part of the national population. 
And in cities like Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, they're an even smaller part of the population. The minority population is a very, very small population. And, and, and the Chinese deny that there are any other ethnic boundaries within the country. People know we're all Chinese, we're, you know, it doesn't matter where you're from, uh, unless you're one of these little minorities, but every other, other than that, no, there's no differences at all. And yet, uh, uh, Western scholars who work on uh, cities like Shanghai are very aware that uh, the majority of migrants who are coming to any one city are, they come from two or three provinces, sometimes a province right nearby, sometimes a little bit further away, but they're mostly a, a people from a particular other province. And those people have a somewhat different language and they have different cooking and they dress differently and they are perceived, they are perceived not only just that they are not local, but they are perceived as having a different culture, despite the fact that, that the Chinese will absolutely deny that there's any ethnic difference. Right? A Westerner says, well, that's what we mean by ethnics, ethnicity right? and ethnic identity, but the Chinese deny it. So this is very interesting how some of the boundaries between locals and non-local people in Chinese cities that a Westerner would see as partly as reinforced by ethnic identity it's denied uh, in China. The other side of it, though, is that, in fact, there are some parts of China with very large minority populations. And the issues there is not the, that they are the migrants in the cities, but they are the locals. And uh, I think the difficult political issue has to do with the policy by the national government of moving Han Chinese into these places, repopulating uh, Inner Mongolia, for example, or repopulating the Western provinces with Han Chinese and uh, giving them uh, privileged positions and uh, stronger, like, better chance to get public housing and better jobs and so on, and, and creating, uh, trying to create, I think, future stability by making even the minority areas not minority after all. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether this is a sus sustainable idea, you know, uh, generally. It's, uh, it's, uh, it certainly gives very strong advantages to an outsider population uh, with respect to a real ethnic minority. And uh, in, the, in the American context, we see that uh, as a real source of trouble. Kong uh, Chang from the uh, Department of Sociology and U.S. So I'm, I'm going to play the devil's advocate here. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if the two of you are overstating the problem of, of you know, a rapid urbanization, because it really depends on the kind of city the, the migrants are moving to. Okay, so uh, uh, we, we heard the respondent saying it's moving from uh, West to East. But actually, if you look at the, the pattern of economic development in this industrialization, it's actually moving westward. You know, the, 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 the Chinese coastal cities are becoming too expensive and new industrialization is moving westward. So surely, you know, some of the mid-sized cities are, are growing. And so if you, if you think not just of the largest cities, if you don't just think of Beijing and Shanghai and, uh, you know, and the largest cities, if you think about the next uh, 100 cities, maybe the problem is not so bad. You're also looking at the, the Chinese government saying that the priority is urbanization. Now, they don't mean the largest cities, they, they mean the, the mid-sized cities. So you, if you look at that, maybe the problem uh, to the two of you is, maybe it's not so bad if you, if you think of mid-sized urbanization. Well, Casey, I certainly agree with you about what, you know, where are the people moving, and there's a great deal what you might call urbanization of the countryside 
going on. So that's quite important. But I, I, I did my best not to say that the problem of uh, urbanization in China is how fast it is, or how urban it is, or how dense it is, or how big it is. No, not really at all. In fact, China overall is under-urbanized, probably. You know, it's only 50% urban. It has a very long way to go, and it's so. Yeah. But what is the problem? The problem is, given the current level of urbanization, what is the structure of the inequalities that are being created between the city and the countryside, and the structure of inequalities and boundaries within the city? At, at a given level of urbanization, the problem is, and how are we managing it? And I'm interested in how we're managing it, not just in terms of do we have enough water, do we have enough housing space, or do we have enough public transportation, but, but how are we organizing advantage and disadvantage within the population? And to what extent are we creating uh, opportunities for mobility and for living better for a broad sweep of the population, rather than concentrating it among the few. It's so surprising to me that China, with the, this tremendous tradition of strong ideology of egalitarianism from the last, you know, from the, from the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, can so easily not perceive inequality as an issue at all. That, I, it's very surprising because even in America, which is one of the most savagely unequal countries in the world, you know, I, this is my self-critique of, of my own country, even, the, even in the U.S., I think the majority of people see rising inequality as actually a, a, a substantial problem, something that we got to do something about. I really appreciate this question. This is something that I've been thinking about a, long, uh, a lot. Uh, <coughs> uh, when, uh, when you say the population actually is moving uh, the, the other way, from the east to the west, that's actually happening uh, in the last few years, when the, the, especially the, uh, after the uh, 2008 economic collapse, uh, around the world, uh, when Chinese uh, do not have those uh, export industries going on. So a lot of uh, uh, the people, they used to work in that area, they don't they lost the jobs, so they have to move somewhere. And the Chinese government in the last few years had been, you know, intentional and, uh, and very uh, uh, forcefully to uh, ask those industries, you know, to, to move to the west. You know where the, 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 they needed the investment and needed the employment for those areas, economic development in the West side. Uh, I'm sure you know, as a social sociologist, you have done probably lots of uh, statistics and, and research. Uh, I really hope to learn from you know your 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 your, your, your results. I really hope that happened. And I, I think the government of China would appreciate it if that's proved to be the real case. But to, I just offer my real experience, my, my real you know, uh, uh, experience with, uh, with uh, the, the project. Uh, but I do projects in, in different cities, uh, like in Guangzhou. I used to work, uh, uh, you know, when you work in any, any of the cities uh, near to the outskirts of the, the coast, coast uh, air, coastal areas, like uh, in, little inland, the industry used to be on, on the coast. Now, suppose that they move inland, <clears throat> but uh, only f f a few of them, because uh, most people want the, 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 the province, like Guangdong, Guangdong province, or Zhejiang province, or, or any province, because, um, when they have to move the, some of the, the industry, in, whether because of the, the, the pollution in the, the, the ocean, or the, the, you know, the higher quality, higher, higher cost of driving them to us, when the Central government tried to you know, relocate those industries to the, to, the, to the inland, but the provincial governments have to do everything they can to keep them within their, their boundary. They move like from Guangdong to Shaoguan instead of Guangdong to Sichuan or Chongqing. Only a few you know, independent developer, uh, industry uh, owners like uh, the Taiwanese company, was, uh, they moved from, from Guang, uh, 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 the, uh, Guangzhou to, to Zhengzhou. 
with you know, major, major uh, corporations. But those are a re relatively rare case. And economically, I think it makes sense because who wants to invest in an area in the West that does not have a good return? So it, it's really, it's, it's, it's about you know, economic uh, uh, terms. Uh, I wish that happens. I, I, I mean, maybe in a future chance, that's what the government has to do. But so far, that has really, 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 really ha uh, happened. So I think generally still, I, I'm not making a conclusion, I just observation. The generation over the last 30 years have generally moved to, to, the, to the use. <clears throat> but in you know, the question, I think it's very good if China can do this, can move the population back to the, to the West, back to the countryside. I mean, we all you know, hope you know, the countryside is, should be, you know, be, be equal to the, the, to the, to the, to the uh, cities, even so if that happens, that really shows the, the central government, what the central government can do to the world, prove to the world, hey, we have got some alternatives. You've got a market system, we've got a central government system that works. I mean, if that ha happens, I would. I would be surprised. I would be surprised. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, really I, I, I like to add something here. I mean, in a way, when you when John says that you know how could you know how could China move so quickly from an emphasis on egalitarianism uh, to you know current uh, income, current state of rapid income inequalities. I mean, I think we are kind of a bit sort of, uh, what am I, what was the word? I mean, in a certain sense, if you look at the world's assessment of China, until fairly recently, it's been celebrating China's growth. It's only now that it started to, you know, to, to kind of say otherwise. And, and in fact, there is a celebration of precisely the destruction of egalitarianism of China that the West has been celebrating since 1980s. And then now we're turning around and say, hey, you're overdoing it and you, you know, you're allowing all these inequalities to exist. But capitalism produces inequalities. That is the nature of capitalism. Not in there, there, I mean, for all the talk of corporate social responsibility, it's no more than trying to humanize the inequalities that, it, that it's unavoidable. So I think we, we need to kind of sort of reflect on what is it that do we want out of this uh, thing. The other interesting thing is that I'm actually not convinced that China has forgotten the fact that it had been communist for the last 50 years. I mean, a lot of writing on China seem to skip from you know, 1949 to the present, right? And the 50 years of ideological experiment somehow is forgotten. And I, I actually think that it is there, it is there, it, it, you know, how it will express itself it becomes quite, a, you know, one may have to look harder. And as I suspect that just like Singapore, at a certain point of development, it would have to start dealing with inequalities. If you look at, if you ask every Singaporean in this room that plays close attention to what happens in Singapore, in the last three years, there's a lot more welfare rollout than what we have for the last 45 years. So, in, in, you know, the growth rate, and perhaps we need to take a longer historical perspective that for the last 20 years, China had to go through this really compressed rapid development. And maybe now the chicken is come back, coming back to roost a little. And, may, and then we, should have enough confidence to think that the Chinese government is paying attention, will be paying attention, may not have the may not have what is in the blueprint right now. But welfare is not avoidable as long as you have a capitalist system. It may take the Chinese government a while to learn about that. But just like I, even in Singapore I've always said you cannot avoid well, cannot avoid welfare. It's only how long you can delay it until you have to deal with the inequalities. Um, hello, Chris Hartley. I'm a PhD student at Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. 
I want to ask about the almost inconceivable idea of deindustrialization. Um, as China loses its competitive advantage in regards to its labor cost structure in manufacturing, uh, we may see a location of uh, this activity away from, from the uh, wealthy coastal areas. And I'm curious as to uh, what the implications for migration would be in under, under that scenario. Um, you had mentioned the uh, migration of African Americans to the American Rust Belt in uh, the early 20th century, but nobody's migrating there now. And uh, it's hard to think of a scenario where the coastal part of China would actually uh, lose its advantage in manufacturing and therefore maybe not necessarily deindustrialize but flatten out. So would the same outcome be for, uh, for migration or migration for different purposes. Um, of course, I also recognize that there may be different labor cost structures in comparison to the inland parts of China. So maybe that manufacturing would locate to the inland parts of China, but that assumes that there's adequate infrastructure there as well. So I just want to get your thoughts on that. Thank you. I'll, I'll just make a short comment. You're really asking what is the nature of the uh, Chinese economic miracle? and what is its future. And uh, one thing I'd like to point out is that although low wage manufacturing has been really crucial uh, to the way that China has developed in recent years, if you look at the structure of the labor force, the urban labor force, uh, the, the great growth has been the expansion of the service sector and uh, all kinds of services, uh, personal services, business services, financial services, you know, these are, these are really the growing sectors of the economy, and, and so uh, we can't just talk about, oh, is it going to deindustrialize? It's been deindustrializing. It's, be, you know, it's moved in the same way that in the 30s and 40s and 50s, the American economy and West European economies restructured, right? So, but, uh, but the, the manufacturing sector is really uh, still key and the big questions are whether, the, whether it's the interior of China that will eventually draw the new low-wage manufacturing investment, or is it going to be Bangladesh or Indonesia or Nigeria or somewhere else? Right? That's the big question. And, uh, and I think you know, like I have no idea. If I knew, I should make some investments somewhere. I just don't know where to do it. Too late yet. <laughs> okay, I, I, <clears throat> well, I, I'm not 100% sure I understand the question, but I think I generally got uh, God's idea, uh, especially after uh, Professor Logan uh, uh, gave some explanations. Uh, I think, but this is a real good question uh, in my perspective. That because uh, I have in the last few years I've been. Uh, uh, do some uh, serious research on, on uh, cultural urbanism. Uh, in that study, I conclude that uh, in the future, you know, the, the job, in, especially industrial jobs, will be less and less because uh, when you have a new technology improving the uh, you know, productivity, you will have uh, less. Uh, that, I mean, that start with a big picture. Uh, so you have less and less industrial uh, jobs. Uh, the, some of the jobs might move to other, other areas, some of the jobs might lost in, in the process. And that's what happens uh, in, in, in the Western countries also, when you know, not all the jobs from the Western countries move to the Asian countries. They, some, some of them are just permanently lost. Uh, so in a, in, a, in a future society, we're probably living in a, in a life that, uh, well, already, how, how many of you know anybody live in, uh, have relatives work as, uh, work as uh, 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 industrial uh, labor? Very little, because it, a few, and, and get fewer and fewer in the future. So most people who work in the service industry, government, cultural uh, services, or all, all that kind of things. So that will, you know, that's the same thing what happened in, in China. The, 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 the coastal area will lose, you know, Manufactured jobs or this is uh, deindustrialized, but those country, the government, I think uh, those industries, the Chinese government has been struggled very hard to try to keep them inside China because a lot of them are now intend to go to different countries, uh, uh, Africa or other Asian countries. 
but uh, the government tried to everything they can to keep them. But still, you know, there's a certain <laughs> economic <laughs> laws you have to, <laughs> you just have to follow. So I don't know what's going to happen, but I think it will be a natural, natural process for some of the industries who uh, out of the coastal areas. So that could, could happen, uh, it's happening, I think, now. Okay. Uh, Raymond Kong from uh, Kong Group LLP. Uh, I, uh, I'd like to have one question to John and one for Lu Pao. Uh, both related to your fantastic slide presentation. Okay, just go back. Uh, the title is New China City. I thought it is New China Cities because when I say China, uh, inside there's actually a lot of China. Uh, it's not just one big China, actually. Uh, uh, so the question for John is that your slide regarding Beijing. I like, I like the picture slides. Remember you, you show us two picture slides on different color. One is the density of the people that moving in, and then subsequently those the, the yellow patch within uh, city uh, Beijing center, and then subsequently when you switch the things slide, then it become a picky, basically it's slightly different. Have you done something similar to other Chinese city like Shanghai? Can you share with us have we done other uh, similar sort of analysis in other part of the city? Whether when you talk about migrations and urbanization, does it have the similar pattern, or is it unique to China because of who pressure? For Mr. Lu, is that uh, your slide? I like the one regarding um, the uh, condominium, whereby after four years there's only one light. That means there's one family that went inside. It shows that there is a huge potential issues actually. Uh, there's a lot of empty condominium in China, which I can see when I go there. And this hopefully doesn't happen in Singapore. You know, here people queue up, and then you have to literally, you know, queue waiting to get into a new condominium. So that sort of situation, do you think how long can it last and when the whole thing will basically create a, a domino effect? We, we uh, face some difficulties in doing good uh, geographic kind of based research, spatial research on Chinese cities uh, because it's hard to get data at a very fine level of resolution. Uh, I showed you data at the level of what we call sub-districts, which are areas with 50 or 100,000 people. It's a pretty large area to say, oh, this is the neighborhood, you know, this is what it's like. But it represents in broad strokes the nature of the, of the pattern. And we find uh, all of the major cities are, uh, have some similar characteristics. Uh, Mr. Liu mentioned the, the process of uh, declining densities in the very center of the city and expansion toward the periphery and the movement from outside to the, to the inner suburbs or maybe even the outer suburbs. And uh, you know, there, there's some kinds of things we see happening uh, generally across Chinese cities. Uh, I think some of them are also quite uh, universal. For example, if I describe uh, a, a pattern of increasing socioeconomic segregation across groups, in Chinese cities, well, I, I could say the same thing about Philadelphia or New York. You know, there are some really basic processes that, that they may not be happening for exactly the same reasons or the same mechanisms, but the outcomes are surprisingly similar. I once did a, uh, the, the first time that I was able to get my hands on data on sub-districts in uh, Tianjin and Shanghai, it was 1990 data. And uh, so this is a period where we're talking about still the socialist pattern of land development and housing was in place at that time. And I, I measured the degree to which college educated people were segregated from not college educated people in these two cities. And I compared it to New York and Los Angeles using geographic uh, units of about the same size. And, and lo and behold, it was the same. That is, the level of educational segregation in these Chinese cities during the socialist period was as high as the segregation between these social classes in America. And obviously, it happens in a different way. In the US, it's by market and money and, you know, private ownership. In China, it was allocation. It was power. It was exercise of authority, but surprisingly, the outcome was the same outcome. And I've been uh, very impressed by this, you know, 
the extent to which across different societies, and I'll bet in Singapore, probably there's something like that too. I would be surprised if not, right? Uh, but through different mechanisms. Right? And, and so understanding the mechanisms is as important to me as understanding the outcomes. I totally agree. It's, uh, to get uh, the, the the data is uh, somehow uh, a little difficult in China. <laughs> I, I tried to get some data myself, but I have a hard time. They don't publicize those things, and uh, it's hard to get from the the, 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 the department to the actually hold this information. But anyway, that's uh, that's the way they, they operate always. But in terms of the 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 the, the, the <laughs> The house, the buildings uh, with a very little residence uh, in there. Uh, well, that's that's been a big issue. So I, I have a conversation, you know, in the last two weeks, just on this issue with a lot of people, and nobody knows what's what would happen. You know, it's already it's already overbuilt, and there are still building, and uh, people are still buying them. When I say people, I, read, I, I just I mentioned in my slides, uh, affluent people, the people with the money, and the, 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 the normal, the, the lower income, the uh, lower classes, they almost uh, irrelevant, unless they have a, 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 child, a kids to, to get married or something have to buy. Uh, but even in that case, most people cannot even uh, pay the, the, the down payment. And the prices are still going up, and they're still building. And nobody knows what's going to happen. So the ghost town issue, I think, was, would be on the top list of their priorities to solve. But I don't know how this is going to happen. It's, it's, it's government, if the government just start collecting taxes on, on property taxes, or like now they're, they're cracking down those corruptions. And uh, there are a number of things that if the government start really you know start doing it, and the housing market might cause the housing market to really collapse. I don't know. You know, the, it, it, I really also, you know, since I have a very strong Chinese uh, uh, background, in, uh, growing up in China, and I know the communist, communist party has a very strong leadership. They can change a lot of things. If you from outside. You see, it's dangerous signs or something, but they have, they have. I think uh, uh, Mao has exceptionally very good basis for the uh, uh, Communist Party to, to to be the ruling party and the ruling country. Uh, uh, if not, if you're not living in there for a long time and get involved deeply, you may not totally understand how how this works. Uh, that's why you know, lots of uh, foreigners uh, uh, projected the, the collapse of this and collapse of that. It didn't, never happened. That's 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 the reason. Uh, you know, they, they could they could mobilize the, the whole country to do one thing, and that's all. It. And you, that, that's what I have experienced. So I don't know exactly what would happen with that, but I think that's the greatest issue. One of the greatest. Yeah. I'm going to take one last question. Before, because we are already at 5.30, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, my name is Lim Tong K from uh, Skyrise Communities. I'm quite optimistic about the prospect of China uh, because I've just returned from a trip in Guangzhou visiting a local company mentioned by the finance minister as being quite innovative and this company has set up a operation in Guangzhou to mass customize clothing. Uh, instead of cutting uh, clothing in a huge bundle, they actually use laser to cut uh, it, you know, each piece by, by itself, so allowing mass customization. On the same trip, there was somebody who wanted uh, them to pr produce uh, uniforms and they said, oh, this is just too low value, we will send it somewhere in the inner city to do. So I think that uh, China has grown so vast and been such a good place for manufacturing that it's really attracting foreign companies that goes there to tap uh, their production capability and bring new models of business into the country. Um, the second point I would like to ask is, 
I remember in the 80s when China started to, to, uh, to, to grow very well and uh, people start to doubt that there's this problem of the rural revolution. And they go back to history and say, oh, every 70 years there is a famine, there's a rural revolution. But I don't think that the future of China is so bleak, and the inequality especially, um, because the rural areas, people who come to the city, actually have some place to fall back to when they retire. Whilst the people in the city have to own their property and they retire in a very expensive place. So the inequality actually, a lot of it is based on the property, or the value of the property. And I think in effect, maybe the equality is not so bad and that the rural revolution will not come to pass. Thank you. I'll just say something since I, we're closing, and I just wanted to, first of all, I wanted to thank you for uh, hanging in so long with us. Uh, we, we run over time. Uh, also, I'd like just to make a couple of general comments, uh, one about how I see the situation. One is, like Mr. Liu, I have a very great respect for the organizational capacity of the state in China. I, I've, I've presented some critiques, and you know, this is what social scientists do. We critique, we critique, we critique, and of course we don't have to act. We don't have to act, so it is quite nice. Uh, and, but, but in terms of uh, over time, the, the Chinese, uh, the, shall I say the regime, has been uh, very skillful and very successful in managing its way through very complicated global currents. Just very, very complicated in a way that uh, we have not seen hardly any other uh, country capable of doing that. So I have tremendous respect for that. Uh, and also, uh, there has been a, a flexibility in terms of uh, the ability to, to turn over real power to somebody else. Not political power, but real power over how investment will be made and where it will be made. And the, the decentralization has been uh, quite strong in China. And uh, the willingness of the state to give that up, and in, in doing so, to give up the ability to make things happen across the board. You know, that, that's, that flexibility is really very, very important. And I'm also very impressed with this capacity, I think you were referring to the technical ability, like to really do things with a very high, fine tolerance, you know, to, to, do, to be exact, right? To really get the job done. Just tremendous. So, so, so I'm, I'm a big fan of China in all of these respects. And, but the one way in which I am not a fan is that I'm not sure that the, the nature of the society that is being created now, the social relationships, the boundaries between groups, I'm not sure that that is going to be sustainable. And I think that uh, very likely that critique is going to grow within China. And it's not going to be a matter of how do outsiders see China? Do, are we afraid of China? Do we love China? Do we whatever? That's not going to be the important thing. The important thing is going to be the capacity of, of, of people within China to create their own sense of what China should be, and then to make that happen. That's going to be the important thing. Uh, first of all, I probably didn't uh, quite answer this. Here, the, the question, uh, maybe you think this, the, the social uh, problems in China may not be that big or not that serious? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you in general sense, but I'm uh, just, uh, uh, in a short, uh, short sentence, I'm cautiously optimistic. That's uh, what I, I feel about China. But I would really want to thank you, everybody, stay this long with us. Uh, and I uh, would have, at least, I know I have been boring, but uh, I hope you enjoy. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, we have run over time, which is evidence of the engagement that has been going on. So let's thank the two guest speakers. Thank you, Professor Logan, Mr. Luho, and Professor Chua for sharing your insights and experiences with us.
We would now like to invite Mr. Ku to present our speakers and moderator with a token of appreciation. Mr. Ku, please. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our lecture. We thank you for your participation and do join us in our upcoming lectures later this month. We will also be seeking your feedback via email and would really appreciate if you could take a minute to help us improve the lecture series. Have a good evening and we hope to see you again. Thank you.